This is a revision video for the A-level biology topic of dihybrid crosses. In this video, we're going to look at the basic geography of a dihybrid cross and also how this leads to that characteristic 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio when two unlinked genes are inherited. When we use the term dihybrid inheritance, we're talking about parents passing on two different genes whose inheritance doesn't affect each other. In other words, they're independently inherited. This means that just because I know an organism's genotype at one gene locus, I can't make any prediction about what alleles they will have for the second gene. In order for this to be the case, the genes must be located on different chromosomes. And also, when those chromosomes are inherited, when they're sorted during meiosis, there must be independent assortment. So we don't, for instance, always see the maternal chromosome 1 with the maternal chromosome 2. If these two conditions aren't met, then we would be able to draw a Punnett square, but we wouldn't get that classic 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio that we're going to talk about. Basically, we would have a Punnett square, but the probability of getting each square within that wouldn't be equal. We can show how this inheritance works using a Punnett square. And the classic question is going to take two different individuals, each of which has one desirous trait. So for instance, you could have a farmer wanting to grow tomatoes and he'll pick one parent who has really red tomatoes and one parent who has really sweet tomatoes. So usually that means that we're going to start with two homozygotes and therefore our F1 generation would be really, really simple because everything is just going to be heterozygous for both genes. And then when we look at the F2 generation, where two individuals from the F1 generation have been put back together and bred together, that's when things start to get more interesting and where we get this classic 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio. Before we look at a Punnett square, I'm going to give you quickly three key assumptions that you want to be making when answering these questions. Now, usually the exam boards do word the questions quite well and will spell these out for you. But particularly if you're going to go on to further study, then it'll just be assumed that you know these things. And so you may as well bear them in mind right from the beginning. The first thing is that unless you're told otherwise, you assume that a parent is homozygous. And you'll sometimes hear this referred to as being true breeding. So what true breeding means is basically doing genetic testing can be relatively expensive. So you're not necessarily going to actually know the genotype of every organism that you work with. But if you have an organism and no matter what you breed it with, all of the offspring share that initial phenotype, that gives you a pretty clear indication that that individual probably is homozygous. So for instance, if you imagine you have a black rabbit, and let's say that rabbits can only be black and white, and no matter how many white rabbits you breed your black rabbit with, you only ever get black babies, there's a very high chance that actually your rabbit is homozygous for that fur colour gene. The second thing that you're going to assume is that if you haven't been told about a particular trait for an individual, then that individual is just normal. And the proper biological term for normal is wild type. This is really important because in studying a lot of genetics, we tend to use mutant populations. And those populations will have been bred over several generations so that each individual has a mutation in one particular gene, but nowhere else in their genome. Otherwise, it just gets really complicated trying to figure out which mutation is causing which phenotype. Finally, if you haven't been told otherwise, you're going to assume that the wild type allele is the dominant allele for a particular gene. This makes sense if you bear in mind that the majority of mutations that you look at are going to be loss of function mutations, where, for instance, an enzyme isn't able to be made in full because the polypeptide has been shortened. But most of the organisms that you study are going to be diploid organisms. So if they still have a wild type allele and they are able to make the full length polypeptide to make the fully functioning enzyme, then they're probably able to upregulate the production of that enzyme in order to make up for the fact that they've also got this broken mutant allele. Now let's look at a classic example of a Punnett square for a dihybrid cross between two individuals who are both heterozygous for two independently assorted genes. Unlike a monogenic cross, we don't have four boxes in our Punnett square, we have 16, but the rest of the layout is probably quite familiar. We have the gametes at the top and down the side, and of course we've done circles around the genotypes to show that these are gametes. Each one of those gametes has an allele for the A gene and an allele for the B gene. 
So you can kind of think of this like a double haploid genotype because the gametes are haploid for each one of those genes, but we're looking at two genes at the same time. So each one of those gametes is going to have one A and one B. And crucially, these two genes are independently inherited. So it doesn't matter which A allele a particular sperm has, that's going to not influence the allele that we have for the B gene. So we start out in just the same way as we would for a monogenic cross. We're pulling the alleles from the top down and the alleles from the left across to the right, and we're just matching them up. You're always going to match together your like alleles. So you can see here that I've got the A's together and the B's together. We're not going to write ABAB. -A -B. Just like we did before, where you've got a dominant allele, you're going to put that first. So it doesn't matter which parent it's come from, you always put your dominant allele first in the genotype. So now we can fill in the rest of the 16 squares in this Punnett square, and we can start to think about what the phenotypes of these individuals will be. So let's say here that we've got a capital A, the dominant A allele is for curly hair, and the lowercase a allele is going to be for straight hair. So firstly, we're going to look for individuals that have curly hair and brown eyes, our two dominant phenotypes. So that could be because they are homozygous dominant, or it could be because they're heterozygous and therefore they're expressing the dominant phenotype. So we've obviously got one individual who is homozygous dominant for both traits, and then there are another eight individuals who have some combination of heterozygosity, which means that they're still expressing both of those dominant phenotypes. So that's nine individuals in total showing the dominant phenotype for both genes. Next, we're going to look for individuals who have that curly hair dominant phenotype, but they have the recessive blue eye phenotype. As you can see, there are going to be three of these. The only way that you can have recessive blue eyes is if you have two alleles that are both recessive for blue eyes. Um, but in terms of the curly hair, we can have a homozygous dominant genotype or a heterozygous genotype. And then likewise, if we look for the straight hair phenotype along with the dominant brown eye phenotype, there are three individuals that meet those criteria. And that leaves us with one over which has both of the recessive phenotypes, so straight hair and blue eyes. So as you can see, when we cross two double heterozygotes and those genes are definitely independently inherited, then we get this classic nine to three to three to one ratio. In order to deduce the phenotype of this heterozygous alien, we need to know which phenotypes are dominant. Although this hasn't been told to us explicitly in the question, because there's been used the uppercase lowercase system, we can work it out very easily. So the dominant phenotypes are going to be the red fur colour and the green eye colour. And therefore, our heterozygous alien is going to have red fur and green eyes. When we're thinking about the genotypes of the gametes formed by an alien, we need to bear in mind that it will have gone through meiosis. So each gamete is only going to contain one allele for each gene. Because the alien is homozygous dominant for the fur colour gene, we can guarantee that the gametes are all going to inherit that dominant capital R for the red fur. But because the alien is heterozygous for eye colour, half of the gametes are going to inherit the dominant allele and half of them are going to inherit the recessive allele. An alien that has green eyes could be homozygous dominant or heterozygous because green eyes is the dominant phenotype. So we don't know which genotype the alien has. It could be capital G, capital G or capital G, lowercase g. But we do know that purple fur is recessive and therefore the only possible genotype for that gene could be two lowercase r's for that homozygous recessive genotype. So therefore, we've got two possible genotypes for that alien. In this final question, we're thinking about mating. And as we said before, we're going to assume that if a particular trait hasn't been mentioned, then the alien is wild type, and that's going to be the dominant trait. So here, our homozygous purple furred alien, we're going to assume that it has green eyes. And then our homozygous yellow eyed alien, we're going to assume has red fur. 
So our purple alien is going to be homozygous recessive for fur colour, giving it purple fur, and homozygous dominant for eye colour, giving it green eyes. And then our yellow eyed alien, we assume it has red fur, so this is going to be its genotype. So then when those two aliens have their offspring, they're going to produce an F1 generation that is all heterozygous for both genes. So now we're going to look at how we would tackle a question which goes all the way through from the parents to the F2 generation. So here we have a population of tree frogs which can be green or they can be red and they can have green eyes or blue eyes. And in order to answer this question, we're going to have to make some of those assumptions. So because the tree frogs are usually green with green eyes, I'm going to assume that those are the wild type phenotypes and that anything else is a mutation. And I'm going to assume that they are dominant. And if we've only mentioned one trait for a particular parent, we're going to assume that for everything else, they are wild type and dominant and homozygous. So let's start off with the skin colour. So I'm going to have my blue eyed frog where we haven't mentioned anything about its skin colour. We're going to assume that it's green and that that's dominant and that it's homozygous, whereas my red frog is going to be homozygous recessive. And then likewise for eye colour, we're going to assume that um, green eyes is dominant. So my red frog is going to have homozygous dominant eyes and then my blue eyed frog is going to be homozygous recessive. So now we can go through those same stages that we always went through with the monogenic crosses. I start off by writing down the phenotypes and I'm going to explicitly say that parent one is green with blue eyes and parent two is red with green eyes. Next, I'm going to write down their genotypes. So homozygous dominant for skin colour and homozygous recessive for eye colour and then vice versa for my parent two. Then I write down the genotype of the gametes and remember here, each gamete is going to have two different alleles in. So it's going to have one allele for the skin colour gene and one allele for the eye colour gene. So in this instance, each frog is only going to produce one type of gamete. So then I can put together my normal Punnett square and I can see that all of my offspring, this is for my F1 generation, are going to be heterozygous for both genes. And so that's going to mean that they end up being green and having green eyes. Now we take two individuals from that F1 cross and cross them to make the F2 generation. So again, we start by writing down the phenotype, which we've just said is green skin and green eyes. Then we write down the genotype, which we've just said is heterozygous for both genes. Then we can think about the gametes. Now here, because each individual is heterozygous for each of the genes, there are four possible combinations for the gametes that they can produce. Once we've figured out what the gametes are, then we're ready to do our Punnett square. So we put the gametes at the top and along the left hand side and we draw circles around the genotypes to show that that's what they are. Then we can start to fill in all of our different genotypes. And then we're ready to start thinking about what the phenotypes for these will be. So firstly, if we think about green frogs with green eyes, these could be homozygous dominant for each of those traits, or they could be heterozygous. So there are nine individuals in total out of those 16 available that have that phenotype. Then green frogs with blue eyes are going to be homozygous dominant or heterozygous for skin colour, but must be homozygous recessive for eye colour. And we can see that there are three of those. Then red frogs with green eyes are going to need to be homozygous recessive for skin colour, but could be homozygous dominant or heterozygous for eye colour. And so there are three of those. And then finally, that leaves us with one frog that has red skin and blue eyes. Thank you very much for watching and I hope you're now feeling ready to look at some scenarios where the phenotypic ratio might deviate from that 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio. If you found this useful then don't forget to like and subscribe for more A-level biology content coming soon.